grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our champion, Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn our attention to our Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 1, which ended with the very first promise of the Savior. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. Dear friends in Christ, we have once again entered that 40-day period of the year, the season that we call Lent. And during these days, especially in our Wednesday services, we focus our attention on the passion history of our Lord. All the suffering Jesus went through to set us free from our sin. If it hadn't been for our sin, our loving God would never have had to come. He would never have had to leave the comfort of his heavenly home and come down to earth in order to live a life of obedience, a life of temptations refused, and a life that ended in suffering and death. So what was it then that led to Lent? In a very real way, we could say it was our sins that led to Lent. If we had not fallen into sin, Jesus would never have had to die for us. However, note this well. Jesus didn't have to die for us. He could have left us to suffer and die on our own. So what really led to Lent was God's love for us. In fact, the entire creation was an act of love for the purpose of love. Because God is love. God created man and the earth on which we live for man purely because God was overflowing with love and he wanted people to pour out that love on. And God's love led him to create Adam and Eve in such a way that they had everything they needed for body and for soul. God put them in a perfect paradise filled with perfect food. He gave them perfect bodies and perfect minds. Think about it. They had perfect DNA. Adam and Eve could have won any Olympic competition and they certainly could have outmathed Albert Einstein. God gave Adam and Eve to each other for companionship. Imagine your spouse being perfect, the perfect lover, the perfect selfless companion in life. Adam and Eve had that. And the Lord gave them meaningful work, tending to the garden, naming everything, filling the earth and subduing it. But God didn't stop there. He took care of their souls as well. God communed with them. He came regularly to walk in the garden with them and talk and communicate his thoughts. And they understood what he was saying perfectly because they were on the exact same frequency and wavelength. But God didn't stop there. He also gave them one of the most prized things on earth, he gave them complete and total liberty. They were not hostages in that garden. God gave them the freedom to leave, to go wherever they wanted, although God did advise against it. That is why God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden right next to the tree of life so that 
they had the freedom to choose. They could choose to eat from the tree God told them not to eat from and die. And they could choose to eat from the other tree that God gave them and live forever. God could have put a fence around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but if he had done that, then Adam and Eve wouldn't have had the choice to say no to what God told them to say no to. They wouldn't have had the opportunity to say, you know, I love God who loves me so much and I trust him and I trust his wisdom. Of course, I'm not going to eat from the tree he told me not to eat from. God gave them freedom. And since they were created holy, unlike us, they were born. Well, they weren't born. They were made with the ability to say no to temptation. At some point during the creation, perhaps on the day he made the heavenly hosts, God made the angels. One of those angels was not content with God. He wanted more power, and he rebelled and led other angels in rebellion. They battled against Michael and the other angels and the, and the serpent. The devil was cast down out of heaven to the earth. And there, as demons are wont to do, he took possession of an animal and he began speaking through it. Now the serpent was more clever than any wild animal which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but not from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. God has said you shall not eat from it you shall not touch it or else you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. In fact, God knows that the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent starts his temptation with a question, one he often uses. Has God really said then when Eve told him what God had said, the father of lies came right out and called the God of truth a liar. You certainly will not die. And then he even tempted Adam and Eve to distrust God's motives. I don't know that he's really looking out for your best here. He's trying to keep something from you. He doesn't want you to be as wise as him. He's challenged in his feeling of power. He's afraid you're going to get powerful. God is trying to manipulate you with fear. God knows that the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Half truth, which means complete lie. Satan uses the very same techniques and lies and dirty tricks with us all the time, doesn't he? He convinces us that God is not treating us quite fairly. God's trying to keep something from us. God really isn't that wise, or at least he doesn't want us to wise up. God's word, can you really trust everything he says in his word? I'm not so sure about that. Sin always starts with a wrong attitude toward God. A lack of trust that God really, 100%, wants what's best for us. And that his word tells us if with 100% clarity exactly what that is and how our lives can be blessed. Sin starts with lack of faith. 
which is why we can't blame it all on the devil. In fact, James wrote in his epistle, the first chapter, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, because God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is dragged away and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Eve, and then Adam, who'd unwisely kept his mouth shut the whole time, both fell for Satan's temptation, hook, line, and sinker. They had the ability to resist temptation. They didn't have original sin. They were created holy and perfect. They had the power to say no. But they did not resist. They didn't just fall into sin. They dove into sin. When the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, huh, and that it was appealing to the eyes, woo, and that there was that the tree was desirable to make one wise, oh, she took some of its fruit and ate. She gave some also to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for their waists. They couldn't escape the consequences. It all became so horribly real. It happened so fast. Like a very embarrassing moment when you blush, they could feel the blood rush to their skin. They could feel the embarrassment sweep over them. A new sensation. They could feel the shame. And there was no way back. There was no do-over. There was no undo button. There was no rewind 13 seconds. Instantly, their bodies began to age. There's that little switch inside that scientists keep searching for. What is it that causes aging? They don't know. And they're looking for it. They're thinking if they find that switch and can change it, we'll live forever again. But they won't because God flipped the switch. Their bodies were degrading and now their souls were degraded, corrupted. They had forever lost the ability to resist sin. And they'd passed on their sin-sick dying nature to their children and their children's children all the way down to you and me. Their whole world was corrupted. Have you seen those microscopic pictures of the beautiful flower that is the coronavirus? When that switch flipped, it made it possible for those viruses to mutate and to spread death and destruction in their waste. They brought decay, they brought earthquakes, they brought tsunamis, they brought tornadoes into the world. They signed their own death warrants, and without our permission, they signed our death warrants also. Now their bodies would return to dust. They had forever, however, done something even far worse. They had broken fellowship with God. They'd cut God off. Did you hear the conversation? The friendship was gone. It was gone on their part, that is. Oh, we were hiding from you because you're the mean ogre, aren't you? 
We don't want to be anywhere near you, God. They were separated from God and they would surely die. And they passed that on to us. With the full weight of their sin beginning to sink in, God did step in. And God turned things around. After describing to them exactly what the consequences were going to be, the thorns, the thistles, the sweat of the brow, the pain of childbearing, the mess that they brought into the world, even when they were trying to make excuses and, and even blame God after blaming each other, God showed that he had not changed one iota. God was and still is love. Instead of crushing Adam and Eve, God promised to crush the tempter. I will put hostility between you and the woman, he said, really talking to Adam and Eve while ostensibly talking to the devil. He wanted Adam and Eve to pay close attention and to hear this. The devil had put hostility between God and man, and God says to the devil, I'm going to turn this back around. I will put hostility between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, one male seed of Eve, he will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. That is one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible if you know what it means. God promised to send a descendant, a seed of Eve, to fix the fine mess they'd gotten us all into. God didn't say this primarily for the devil to hear, although it was a threat that hung over the devil's head until Jesus was finally born and he finally knew who that seed would be. But God said this for Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.15 was there John 3.16. It was God's promise that one day he himself, God himself, would fix it. Adam and Eve had run away from God. They'd come to believe he was their enemy and their greatest fear. But God ran after them in love. He turned their hostility away from him and back to where it belonged. Hostility toward that old evil foe and he did it he changed their attitude by making a promise and that is what Paul meant when he said I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes it was the gospel promise Genesis 3.15 that put faith and trust back in Adam and Eve's hearts so that now they could say, you know, next time God says no, we better not do that. And next time God says, you shall, ooh, we should probably do that. Because we trust God. We learn. We know that God loves us. Man may change, but God always remains the same. It was because God was so full of love that he created man in the first place, that he created this wonderful world for us to live on. And it was because of love that even after their wickedness, their sin, God came back with a rescue plan 
for them. And it's because of God's love that he will, in fact, one day restore paradise for Adam and Eve. And for us, too, we get to give there, to live there. So what is it that led to Lent? Yes, certainly it was Adam and Eve's sin. But again, God didn't have to come up with a plan. God did not have to send his son to live a perfect life in our place, endure the years of obeying adults who knew so much less than him, of being mocked and being ignored and being finally attacked and arrested by his enemies in Jerusalem. Jesus didn't have to do any of that. He could have just let us live and die in our mess and shame. It was God's love that brought Lent to be. May we learn with Adam and Eve the lesson Trust God. He knows what he's talking about. Trust his promises. Trust his love. He intends nothing but good for each and every one of us. And let us also learn from Jesus that no matter how difficult the circumstance or the temptation, we're always better off following God.